Well, somebody say praise the Lord. Praise the somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. And if you love the Lord, give him a great big clap offering. Amen. And amen. Now, the title of today's message is Moshe and Mashiach. God bless you. And it is based on this week's Torah portion, Vayelech. And uh, the teaching will include some significant midrashing. For those of you who don't know what midrash means, it means, comes from the root word darash, to investigate, to search out a matter, to dig deeper into the scriptures, to look for the hidden manner of the Bible. Now in the past, we've looked at some of the parallels between the life of Moses and the life of Yeshua. Here's some examples. There was a tragic killing of male babies when Moses was born, according to Exodus 2, verse 1, and also when Yeshua was born, according to Matthew 2, verse 13. Moses was kept safe from persecution by being hidden in Egypt, even in the house of Pharaoh, says Exodus 2, verse 6 through 10. And Yeshua was delivered from persecution, being hidden in Egypt, according to Matthew 2, verse 15. Moses wandered through the wilderness for 40 years, says Numbers 32, verse 13, and Yeshua wandered through the wilderness for 40 days, according to Mark 1, verse 13. Moses lifted up a serpent on a pole in the wilderness to bring healing to the Israelites, says Numbers 21, verse 8. Yeshua had to be lifted up on a tree of sacrifice to, be, to bring eternal healing to his people, according to John 3, verse 8. 14. Both Moses and Messiah were born during a time of national bondage, meaning under Egypt and under Rome. Both redeemers are destined to break the bondage of Israel and lead Israel into the promised land, meaning the land of Canaan and the kingdom of heaven. Both performed unparalleled signs, wonders, and miracles to validate their ministry. Both act in the role of lawgivers and authority of Torah, and both fill the role of intercessor between God and nation. Now, in this week's Torah portion, Vayelech, which means, and he went, we see even further parallels between Moses and Yeshua, especially in connection with the Torah of God. First, let's look at a comparison between Moses and Yeshua in the Garden of Gethsemane, in Hebrew it's Gath Shemin, which means oil press. And if you have your Bibles, I hope you do, let's please turn to Deuteronomy chapter 31. And let's read verse 1 and 2, which was our Torah reading a few moments ago. Deuteronomy 31. Verse 1 and 2. Then Moses went, Vayelech, and spoke these words to all Israel. And he said to them, I am 120 years old today. I can no longer go out and come in. Also, the Lord has said to me, you shall not cross over this Jordan. What's happening here is that Moses is about to die. And according to Jewish tradition, it was on the seventh day of the month of Adar when the Lord announced to Moses that he was about to die. That's in this same chapter in verse 14. Verse 2 also tells us it was Moshe's birthday. He says, I am 120 years old today. So therefore, the seventh day of Adar is the anniversary of both the birth and the death of Moses. Now, when you think about that, that is similar to Melech David, King David who according to Jewish tradition was born and died on the same day on Shavuot. And we know that both Moses and David love God's Torah. Both had a full cycle, if you will, from the day they were born to the day they died. And by no coincidence on Simchat Torah, we repeat a full cycle of the Torah. That's really something. Perhaps God worked it out that way for them, meaning both Moses and David. Now, also, according to Jewish legend, Moses does not go passively or willingly to his death. 
Rather, in anguish of soul, he argues for his life and beseeches God for mercy. Now, it seems strange that tradition would paint Moses, who is a hero of all Judaism, as reluctant to accept death. But Moses is an example for all of God's people. From him, we learn that we are not to accept death passively. The Torah itself, given by Moses, tells us in Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, choose life that you may live. I'd like to thank Pastor Darrell for bringing and highlighting that scripture to us in his teaching last week. Now, however, are we listening, everyone? In some Christian circles, there is an unhealthy fascination with death. Some actually look forward to death when it comes since 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8 tells us to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But folks, death is the enemy. As a matter of fact, it is the last enemy, according to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 26, and Revelation 20, verse 14. Now, we know death is inevitable, but it should never be our hope. It is never our desire. That is up to God. God has the issues of life and death in his hands. Now, in the same way, Yeshua, the second Moses, if you will, goes to his death in anguish. His struggle in Gethsemane after sweating great drops of blood, saying, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass me by and his agonizing cry from the tree of sacrifice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Well, that makes that clear. Yet ultimately, both Moses and Yeshua, they surrender to the will of the Father, for it is in submission to the Father that life is found. In a sense, they both chose life even when facing death. How? By being obedient to the Father. And we know that there are blessings for obedience. And guess what? They both lived again. It's obvious because Yeshua rose from the dead. Somebody say he's risen. <laughs> and Moses appeared with him, Yeshua and Elijah, on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17. It's obvious that Moses lived on as well. By the way, I believe Moses and Elijah are the two witnesses in the book of Revelation chapter 11. And you know what? I threw that one in for free. Uh, let me hear a real such a deal. Okay, that's better. Now, verse 1 of Deuteronomy 31 says that Moses went, again, vayelech, and spoke these words to all Israel. Now, ordinarily, Moses would summon all Israel to him as you read the rest of the Torah. But now he, Moses, personally went to them to offer them comfort regarding his imminent death. And in the same way, another comparison, Yeshua spent his last evening with his disciples at the last Seder, offering them words of comfort before his imminent suffering and death, saying in John 14, verse 1, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And also in John 14, verse 3, he says to his disciples at the last Seder, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am you may also be. I will come again and receive you to myself. And how many of you know today he is coming back? Hallelujah. Now what does Moses mean when he says in verse 2, I am no longer able to come and go. What does that mean? Does it mean that he is decrepit and bent over with old age? Can't be that because Deuteronomy 34 verse 7, a couple of chapters later, tells us that his eyes did not dim nor did his vigor diminish. So therefore, there must be another explanation for why he said that. Now the Talmud, rabbinic commentary, offers this. He can no longer go out and come in with the words of Torah, indicating that the gates of wisdom were now closed against him because the time had come to transfer his authority to Joshua, 
which he does in verses 3 through 8 here. However, the great accomplishment of Moshe's life was that thanks to him, God still went, Vayelech, God still went with Israel because of Moshe's numerous times of intercession, God did not destroy Israel. A couple of examples would be in Exodus 32 with the golden calf incident, God was ready to destroy the people, but Moses interceded and God relented. And also in Numbers 21, when he put the serpent up on the pole, Moses stood in intercession for the people of Israel. So now on the very edge of the land, he, Moses, must let them go. But God, but God is still with them. Now we're still in Deuteronomy 31, let's read verse 9. So Moses wrote this law in Hebrew Torah and delivered it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord and to all the elders of Israel. Let's hold it up there. When Moses realizes that this is the last day of his life, he knows that there is still one task that still remains, and that is for him to finish writing the scroll of the Torah. He wants to be sure the Torah will live on with the Israelites after he's gone. Up until then, he served as a living Torah. This is interesting. He served as a living Torah because he heard directly from God, and then he communicated it to the people. You could say he was a conduit for the voice of God. And as a conduit for the voice of God, he actually was like a Torah made flesh. Now let's take that a step further. As believers in Yeshua, how many of you are believers? Raise your hand up high, hallelujah. As believers in Yeshua, we recognize that our Messiah is the prophet like Moses. For Moses said in Deuteronomy 18 verse 15, the Lord your God will raise up a prophet like unto me from your own brethren, from your own midst. Him you must listen to. And Yeshua is the Torah made flesh. He is a living Torah. But he transcends even Moses because Yeshua is not only a conduit for the word of God, his very being is the word of God. As I always say, every jot and tittle of the Torah is the spiritual DNA of the Messiah, Yeshua. And not only that, he, Yeshua, is the eternal living Torah. He is the ongoing living word. Now, Hebrews 4 verse 12 adds that the word of God is living and active. You know what that means? It means that Yeshua is living and active in our lives today. Hallelujah. Now let's move on here and let's pick it up in verse 10. And Moses commanded them saying, at the end of every seven years, at the appointed time in the year of release, that would be the Shemitah year, at the Feast of Tabernacles, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses, which would be Jer Jerusalem, you shall read this Torah before all Israel in their hearing. Gather the people together. Now that word gather reads in Hebrew, hakhel, hakhel, that's an important word. Gather the people together, men and women and little ones, and the stranger, the ger in Hebrew, who is within your gates, that they also may hear and that they may learn to fear the Lord your God and carefully observe all the words of this Torah, and that their children as well, who have not known it, may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land which you cross the Jordan to possess. So in order to meet the needs of future generations, Moses gives the commandment for the whole assembly to gather, hakhel in Hebrew, to gather together for a covenant renewal ceremony. Now it's interesting that that word hakhel is a derivative of the Hebrew word kahal, which means assembly, as in the assembly of Israel or the assembly of believers. If we could find that first PowerPoint, 
you can see there, if you reverse the last three letters of kahal, it becomes kala, which means bride, as in the bride of Messiah. And let's face it, the assembly of believers and the bride of Messiah are one and the same. So every seven years during the Feast of Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, after the sabbatical year, meaning after the year of release, after the Shemitah, the whole assembly gathered together to hear all the words of Torah. Now Deuteronomy 16 verse 16 tells us it was already a mitzvah, it was already a commandment for the men of Israel to ascend the place God chooses, again Jerusalem, for the feast of Sukkot year after year. But now Moshe commands that at the end of the seventh year, all Israel, not just the men, but the whole kahal, the whole assembly must undertake the pilgrimage to hear all of the Torah, which included the native born Israelites, men, women, children, and the stranger, the ger, and their children, according to verse 12. Now furthermore, the mitzvah of reading the Torah before the entire assembly of Israel was fulfilled by the king of Israel in the future. The reason for that, because the commandment, you shall read this Torah in front of all Israel in verse 11, is formulated in the singular. So only the king had the power and the authority to do so, to do this in the future. Deuteronomy 17 verse 18 tells us, any future king over Israel had to keep a copy of the Torah close to him and read it all the days of his life. It was incumbent upon the king to read the Torah to all the people once every seven years during the Feast of Tabernacles. Now the commandment of Hakhel, again, the commandment of gathering the assembly is prophetic for all believers. The Hebrew word for assembly, Hakhel, is translated into Greek as ekklesia, which means called out ones, assembly, or church. According to Strong's Concordance number 1577, so therefore, the commandment to hear the Torah in the seventh year is a commandment of the entire ecclesia, not just for the people of Israel, but hallelujah for those who are grafted into the olive tree of Israel. Praise the Lord. And by no coincidence, the Torah says here in Deuteronomy 31 verse 12, that the whole assembly includes men, women, children, the native born, and the stranger from the nations, and their children. Now prophetically, some of you may have guessed this by now, this also points to the millennial reign of the Messiah, when all the nations of the earth will come up to Jerusalem during the Feast of Sukkot, when the Torah will go forth from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, when the Torah will be taught by the king himself, meaning King Yeshua. Only he's not any ordinary king, is he? I can't hear you. He's no ordinary king, is he? Why don't you stand with me for a minute? Let's get verbal. Let's get active. Let's get on fire. He's no ordinary king. He is the king of kings. He is the king of glory. He is the king of the universe. He is the king of heaven and earth. He is the king of all creation. He is the king of Jerusalem. He is the king of Israel. His kingdom will surely swallow up all the kingdoms of the earth. He's coming back again, hallelujah. And he's coming to rule and reign the whole earth from Jerusalem. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end, hallelujah. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Yeshua I said, Yeshua is Lord of all to the glory of God the Father. If you believe that, give the Lord a great big clap offering. Hallelujah. Somebody give the Lord a shout of praise. He's worthy. 
Hallelujah. Give him the glory. Praise God. Hallelujah. Okay, we can be seated for a moment. Now, this is a very important teaching, especially because most of us here were coming to the tabernacle, a Messianic Jewish congregation, to learn the biblical Jewish roots of our faith in the Messiah. This teaching is quite about that. Now, let's take a closer look at the public reading of the Torah. As we've already seen, the commandment of Hakhel can only be kept when Israel is in the land, when there is a temple standing in Jerusalem, and when the king of Israel is present. However, this was not the case in the days of Ezra the scribe. Though they rebuilt the temple and even read the Torah during the festivals, there was no king over Jerusalem at that time. Yet Ezra ascended in the temple courts and read the Torah to the assembly of Israel throughout the feast of Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles. So I'd like you now to turn to, keep your finger in Deuteronomy 31, but let's turn to Nehemiah chapter 8. And the book of Nehemiah is after the book of Ezra and before the book of Esther, between Ezra and Esther. Nehemiah chapter 8. I'll give you a minute to get there. Time's up. Nehemiah 8, verse 17. So the whole assembly, underline that, it reads hakahal, of those who had returned from the captivity, meaning the Babylonian captivity, made booths, Sukkot, and sat under the Sukkot. For since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, until that day, the children of Israel had not done so. Think about that for a minute. That is a very long period of time. That probably is several hundred years from the days of Joshua until they came back from the Babylonian exile. No wonder the rest of the verse reads, and there was very great gladness. Also, day by day, from the first day until the last, he, meaning Ezra, read from the book of the law of God. And it reads, Sefer HaTorah there. And they kept the feast seven days, and on the eighth day, Shemini Yatzeret, there was a sacred assembly according to the prescribed manner. Now, other verses in Nehemiah 8 tell us that the Torah of Moses was read to the people all day long. So you might say they were doing the best that they could without a king being present. Now, in time, Ezra and his contemporaries, they broadened the scope and the frequency of the commandment to gather the assembly. They did this how? By creating the local assemblies of the synagogue system and by instituting the weekly Torah reading cycle, meaning the designated Torah portions. And through the synagogue system, the mitzvah of assembly or hakhel from Deuteronomy 31 could be now fulfilled on a weekly basis. They broadened the scope and the frequency of it. Now, the average person did not possess a personal copy of the Torah, but rather the whole community had one scroll of the Torah jointly, meaning they shared one together, like we do here at the Tabernacle. By the way, I'll give you more of the history of our Torah on Simchat Torah. So therefore, they would gather each week on Shabbat to hear a portion, a parsha in Hebrew, of it read aloud and then teachers and sages would then expound upon the reading and this would be a public reading of the Torah that is significant for later. Thus the synagogue service was born and much of it is the same today. Now we see evidence also of this continuing in the Brit Hadashah and the New Covenant. 
Some of you may have been thinking, well, Rabbi Jeremy, that's very interesting about Ezra and his contemporaries creating the synagogue system in the Tanakh, in the Old Covenant. But what about, where do we see that in the New Covenant? Well, we're going to look at that. If we could find the next PowerPoint. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13, Paul tells Timothy, until I give attention to the public reading of scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Now this is significant because it shows that Paul's congregations were indeed synagogues. In fact, the Greek word that is translated as public reading of scripture there is the single word anagnosis, which is used elsewhere in the Brit Hadashah, such as in Acts 13, verse 15, which says, after the reading, after the anagnosis, the public reading of the Torah and the prophets, the synagogue officials sent to them, brothers, if you have a word of exhortation or teaching for the people, then say it. And in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 14, says, but their minds were hardened, for until this day at the reading, anagnoses, again, the public reading of the Torah, the same veil remains unlifted, but it is removed in the Messiah. Meaning, when the veil is lifted, they could see Yeshua in the Torah. How many of you have discovered that the more you read the Torah, the more you see Yeshua in it? Remember, he is the Aleph and the Taf. He's the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. He's the word of God that endures from everlasting to everlasting. So what does all of this tell us? It tells us that the congregations of the early Messianic believers still followed the synagogue practice of the public reading and the teaching of Torah from Sabbath to Sabbath. Just like we do today, as well as many other Messianic Jewish congregations all over the world, which are comprised of Jew and Gentile alike. I ask you, how many of you are glad we are all one in the Messiah? Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And how many of you are glad that we are a spirit-filled Messianic Jewish, Torah observant congregation on fire for Yeshua HaMashiach, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Let's give the Lord some more praise. Hallelujah. Okay, I had you keep your finger in Deuteronomy 31. Let's go back there. Deuteronomy 31, first let's read verse 16. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, you will rest with your fathers, and this people will rise and play the harlot with the gods of the foreigners of the land, where they go to be among them, and they will forsake me and break my covenant which I have made with them. Let's go to verse 26. So after hearing that from the Lord, Moses now speaks to the Levites, and he says in verse 26, Take this book of the law, Sefer HaTorah, and put it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there as a witness against you. Let's go down to verse 29. For I know that after my death you will become utterly corrupt and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you, and evil will befall you in the latter days, emphasis in the latter days, because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger through the work of your hands. So the Lord tells Moses here in verse 16 that after he dies, the people are going to forsake the Torah. So for this reason, Moses is to leave a written Torah behind as a witness against them. Now, we've been looking at a lot of parallels between Moses and Yeshua. Here is another one. There is an exact parallel between Moses and Yeshua here as well. Because after Yeshua was taken from us, we forsook the Torah. 
Yeshua saw this and he warned his disciples and us in Matthew chapter 24 that lawlessness, Torahlessness, reflected by the Greek word anomia, would abound that, that many false prophets would arise. Do you know that Deuteronomy 13 describes a false prophet as one who leads God's people away from the Torah, the commandments of God? I know we have several people here for the first time, so I want to make this disclaimer. We love God's Torah but we know we can't be saved merely by Torah observance only. We can only be saved by the shed blood of Yeshua HaMashiach. Hallelujah. Somebody say there's power in the blood. Power. Amen. But Paul also warned in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that the mystery of lawlessness, Torahlessness, was already at work in the early days of the body of Messiah. And within less than one century, of Yeshua's death and resurrection, the heresies arose. And they were called the Anomians, the Anomians, the lawless ones, the Torahless ones. Some of them were Gnostics who worshiped angels and who taught that everything in the physical realm was evil. But we know after God created the heavens and the earth, he saw it and he called it very good. Some were hedonists who taught that life was all about pleasure. Some were aesthetics whose philosophy was all about beauty. And some were idolaters. The only thing that they shared in common was their rejection of a literal reading of the commandments of God. Yeshua refers to them as the Nicolaitans and the followers of Jezebel in Revelation chapter 2, verse 15 and 20. And Peter refers to them in 2 Peter 3, 16 as the untaught and unstable and that they distort the scriptures to their own destruction. Now at first, their voice among believers was small, was not that influential. But as Rome turned against Judaism more and more, and as non-believing Judaism banned believers from the synagogue, which Yeshua said would happen, anomia without Torah grew rampantly. Within one generation, many believers turned away from the commandments of God. And as Christianity began to further take shape, the Sabbath, the festivals, and the commandments of God were abandoned and forsaken. Not only that, but through the Church of Constantine, they were replaced with non-biblical festivals, being replaced with pagan festivals, which was prophesied by Daniel in chapter 7, verse 25, that the anti-Messiah, the spirit of the anti-Messiah, would change God's appointed times and seasons, including Shabbat and the festivals. And that apostasy is still with us today. But God, somebody say, but God. But God has a plan. Let's read one last scripture from Deuteronomy chapter 30. Verse 6 and verse 8. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all of your soul, that you may live. Verse 8. And you will again, that is a prophetic by nature, you will again obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments, which I command you today. You see, all along, Hashem had a plan to circumcise the hearts of his people in the future, that they may walk in his mitzvot, walk in his commandments again. In Jeremiah chapter 31, we know that God prophesied, behold, the days are coming when I will make a new covenant, a brit hadashah with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. I will put my Torah in their minds and I will write it upon their hearts, 
and they will all know me from the least to the greatest, declares the Lord. And we know that that was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2 during the Feast of Shavuot, which commemorates the giving of the Torah, which always coincides with the day of Pentecost, when God circumcised our hearts through the power of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. And guess what? The Holy Spirit is only given through Yeshua, who is the Torah made flesh. You could say on Shavuot and Pentecost, God changed us from the inside out. And when you're abiding in the spirit, it's easy to obey God's commandments, which are pure and good and holy, loving instruction from our, our father to his children, because the Torah and the spirit work together. As a matter of fact, they were both given on the same exact day. 1,500 years apart. That was no coincidence. And when it comes to Torah obedience, it's not legalism, it's not bondage, but rather our attitude should be, it's not that we have to, but hallelujah, we get to. Amen, Amen. hallelujah. So in conclusion, I know that we have our Yom Kippur services this Tuesday night and Wednesday, but we also are now approaching the Feast of Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles. And we have a king, don't we? Yes. Amen. And the king is present. He lives in our hearts. His name is King Yeshua. We have a temple because we are the temple of the living God. Hallelujah. Let's all stand. And furthermore, we have come up to Mount Zion, to the city of our God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to a multitude of angels, to the assembly, Hakahal, of the firstborn, where our names are written in heaven. And God has given us a designated place to hear the Torah of Moses and to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles down the road at 1333 B Creek Road at our Learning Center at the Sukkot Retreat, which is gonna be from October 13th through the 17th, and also during Shabbat services here at the Tabernacle at 256 Church Road in Branson. I ask you, how many of you love God's Torah? And how many of you love Yeshua, the Torah made flesh? Give God the praise. Let's have the worship team come back up. Hallelujah. Let's find number 73 on the overhead. And if you're here today and you want deeper revelation of the Torah of God, of the Word of God, the whole Word of God, you can come down to the front. Someone will anoint you and pray over you. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your teaching to us today. Thank you, Lord God once again, that you are a faithful covenant-keeping God, even to a thousand generations of those who love you and who obey your commandments and who follow in the footsteps of your son, Yeshua, the Messiah, the Torah made flesh. We love you. We love your word, O oh God. Amen. Thank you for your faithfulness. Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in the heavens. There is no God like thee in the
the earth. O Lord God of Israel, O Lord, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in the heavens. There is no God like thee in the earth. O Lord God of Israel. That keepeth covenant and showeth mercy unto thy servants that walk before thee with all of their heart with all of their heart O Lord God of Israel there is no God like thee in the heavens. There is no God like thee in the earth. O Lord God of Israel, that keepeth covenant, that keepeth covenant, and show with mercy unto thy servants that walk before thee with all of their heart with all of their heart Keepeth covenant that keepeth covenant and showeth mercy unto thy servants that walk before thee with all of their heart, with all of their heart. Lift up holy hands to the Lord. O oh Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in the heavens. There is no God like thee in the earth. O oh Lord God of Israel, O oh Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in the heavens. There is no God like thee in the earth. O oh Lord God of Israel, that keepeth covenant and showeth mercy unto thy servants that walk before thee with all of their heart 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 
with all of their heart, with all of their Iverecha Adonai Vayishmarecha Yair Adonai Panavalecha Vikunecha Isa Adonai Panavalecha Viasemlecha Shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Perfect peace, B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach, the Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace. Altogether, that thy way may be known upon the earth and thy salvation among all nations. And again, if you love the Lord, let's give him another great big clap offering. <laughs> Hallelujah.